Good morning. Welcome to Trainwreck Marriage. I'm Dave Touchton. And I'm Susan Touchton. Hey, uh, today we're going to kind of go over the last two weeks. We've, we've missed a couple of times due to a whole bunch of situations that were out of our control and um, just some real tough times. And I want to take this time before we get started. Uh, you know, we highly recommend counseling. Uh, if you're going through something, a good Christian counselor can really help you, help guide you and help keep you out of the ditches, uh, because it's, it's almost impossible to do alone. And I can tell you after a lot of years of therapy, it's, it's worth it because you get to figure out who you are. So as you go through situations, we, we really want to encourage you to definitely get professional help. Um, I would recommend, uh, counselor over a pastor because most pastors aren't qualified to counsel um they mean well but sometimes they're not and so um really just it's one of those things that if you're not going to help yourself probably nobody's going to help you so at some point in time you've got to decide hey i probably could use some help because a lot of how we got to where we're at right now was three years of counseling that's just true and so but anyway, I just felt like I needed to say that this morning and kind of kick it off with, um, really, if, if you're struggling, get some counseling. Uh, I know you'll think it's a waste of money, but I can promise you it's not. And I guess I would just, um, you know, make sure it's a good Christian counselor. Be cautious of um, who you go, you know, speak to, who you go um let pour into you. And so, and a lot of, a lot of counseling is not necessarily them, um, giving you advice or how to get through or whatever, but it's just, um, listening, you know, a good counselor is going to listen and ask some probing questions. And so, um, I would just encourage you if you are looking for a counselor, just be sure that it's one that is, um, led by the Holy Spirit, and that um, comes highly recommended probably by others. Um, and, and the reason that we say counseling is so important is because a lot of times we just hold on to things that we need to let go of. And when I say that, it means just speaking it, you know, getting it off of our chest or whatever the case may be. Um, versus just burying it inside of us and letting it fester because um, eventually it will um, eat you alive. And so getting it out, um, whether it be through journaling or through a counselor or whatever the case may be, um, we have found is very important and very significant. Yeah, and we're not even talking just divorces. We're talking deaths in the family, um, dealing with loved ones that have died. I mean, it really kind of covers the gamut. I've, I've been multiple times for multiple reasons. Um, and so, anyway, I just felt like we really hadn't gave a plug to all the counseling out there. And, and uh, yeah, there's good counseling. There's bad counseling. But you, if you don't take the first step, no one's going to do it for you. But yeah, we're just coming off an exhausted weekend of uh, being in Arizona at Susan Sisters Memorial. And, um, you know, we, we've had a lot of things in life throw up at us um, that's made it tough. So, um, yeah, I don't, uh, this week is just hard to, like, I don't know what God wants to speak through us today. I don't know what people need to hear um, and so, yeah, it's been kind of a, a long journey from, um, her death to the memorial and, um, I'm glad it's behind us. Um, but, um, uh, it was a sweet time with, with family and, um, with her daughters. Um, and so I'm thankful for that and just, um, you know, I don't know, uh, I know that her memorial touched her life, touched lots of people. And I guess maybe that's the, maybe the moral of the story is, um, what is your life, um, counting for? Are you making a difference in the lives of others by the way that you live your life? And so, um, just kind of doing some reflecting on that and, um, seeking God and what 
he wants uh, to do through us and what, how he wants to write our story and the people that he puts in our paths and why and how to um, have a relationship with them or minister to them or whatever the case may be. I just know that all the lives that Rhonda touched, um, they said about her smile um, that she was such a blessing and that she was kind to everybody. And so just really thinking that through and, and wondering, um, up to this point, what would people say, um, at my service, you know, what would people say about me and would they be able to say the kind things that they said about her? And so just, you know, throwing the question out there, how are you living your life? How do you want to make a difference in somebody else's life? Do you want to make a difference in somebody else's life? Or are you just surviving life? Well, I think that, yeah, you bring up some really good points. Because the thing is, you know, in most situations, you don't really tell the... Per- We're expecting everyone else to live as long as us. It's it's really kind of crazy the way we think about things. Because we think, ah, I ain't going to call them. They're going to... We don't say they're going to live forever, but I'll do it later. And later never gets here. And, you know, it it was good hearing what people had to say. Um, But Susan brings up a good point. I mean, what are people going to say about you? Um, And I I mean, are you a crotchety old bastard or are you going to be someone that loves everybody? I mean, and that's, I guess that's the thing is, It's not about making people happy, and that's not my point at all. Um, But do you have happiness? Because that's there's a big difference between trying to be a people pleaser, keep people happy. Um, Yeah, they'll say good things about you, but if you're just happy, people say the same thing about you. You know. uh, (coughs) (coughs) Sorry, I'm got allergies. Um. You know, and that's that's one of the things that um, a lot of lot of what one thing I heard was, you know, she had been in a car wreck many years ago and had broken ankles and stuff like that, and and lived with chronic pain. And people said she, a lot of them had known her for years and never knew she was in chronic pain. I mean, you know, are you a whiner and complainer? Is that going to be what they put on your tombstone or? You know, did you take care of people, think a lot of them, or talk to them, or, you know, really, what what is your life goal? What do you want to be remembered for? Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to be remembered for an alcoholic, that is easily done. Get a handful of DUIs and spend every night at the bar. I mean, really, you, you kind of predict by not thinking it's who you are. And I guess that's kind of my thing is, uh, you know, where do you step? Take a step towards you, who you are. And what does that look like? Not looking for a quick fix answer, but it is a question to be asked every day of, you know, who do I want to be? The one that complains all the time or the one that's happy all the time? Well, and if you think about it, you know, our lives are supposed to, um, we are supposed to live like Jesus lived, is what the Bible tells us. And so what does that mean exactly? Um, he loved really well. Um, even those who were not lovable, he loved them. Um, he healed, he spoke life into people. He, um, loved well. And so just, um, an example, you know, our lives are supposed to be an example of that. And obviously some days are easier than others. Um, but when people see you, do they see Jesus's love? Um, when people interact with you, do they, are they interacting with Jesus? Um, you know, and and I'm saying that more to myself, really more than, than anybody that might be listening is, you know, I want to represent Jesus well, not because he needs me to but because of the sacrifice he made for me. And I want people to be drawn to him um, because he made that same sacrifice for them. And so um, just really thinking about even when in the most difficult, hardest times, um, 
going through the muck and the and the just the significance of loss, um, still being able to radiate Jesus's love because um, Jesus also lost. You know, Jesus wept when Lazarus died, and um, but yet he was still kind and loving, and um, so you know, just kind of trying to emulate the way that he was. Um, and again, sometimes it's just harder than others, but that's, that's what I pray that my, you know, legacy would be is to, um, you know, when, when it's my time to go, that people would say the same thing they said about my sister, you know, they, that she, that Susan loved the way that Jesus loved. Um, but it's, it doesn't come naturally. And it's something that I just try, you know, hope to strive for. Well, and she caught me mid drink of a cup of coffee. Um, the thing is, <coughs> I'd like to clarify, we are not talking about being religious and cramming the Bible down people's throat and beating them with them. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, when you know, who Jesus is, people see him through you. Um, it's not about being ran over, but it is about being truthful. It is about loving people where they're at, not not loving people if they change. You know, and I, I think sometimes, uh, you know, when really when you mention living like Jesus, sometimes that gets a little confusing in the current church environment we have. Um, where it says, you know, you need to change to be loved here. Um, and that, that, for me, that dog don't hunt because, you know, you just love people where they're at and let God change them. That's God's problem to change, not yours. And, uh, you know, as you go through times of death and, and worrying about family members and, you know, it's really at what point do you really count on God? And and what does that look like? Because none of us want to lose a family member. It is heartbreaking. We didn't plan on it. We felt like they would live with us till old age, whatever that means. And when they don't, um, or even if they do, I mean, I think a mom passing away. I mean, we all knew it was coming. It still was traumatic. And, and, you know, it was, it was still one of those things that was very, um, really life changing, I guess would probably be a good word for it, but we all knew it was coming cause she had Alzheimer's for 15 years. So I don't think, I don't think you can discredit, um, if you know it's coming, it doesn't make it any easier, I guess. No. And I, that, that's true. Um, and you still have to, you know, work through it. Um, the goal would be, you know, to draw closer to Jesus and let him um, work through you and, and comfort you and strengthen you. Um, and again, some days are better than others, you know. And so um, just it's going through the process. And there's, you know, we all have heard and know that there's different stages of grief. And, um, you know, when you while I was in Arizona, I would say one of the days that I was going through, you know, being the angry and, um, trying to represent Jesus well through that anger when honestly, some of my anger was towards him because, you know, why did he allow this to happen kind of thing? But something else they said at, at her service was she never asked why me, um, she asked the question, why not me? And so when she was walking around on bad ankles for the last 20 some years, um, you know, the question is, was never why me, God, but why not me? And I think we are, we're all given opportunities to learn lessons and, um, don't know why she was in the wreck. Don't know why she had bad ankles. Um, but her testimony, um, could have helped somebody or help them look at things differently and not have a woe is me mentality. Um, you know, her death is a lesson to somebody. If it helped one person, my niece and I were talking, um, about that, you know, if one person was drawn close, closer to God and, 
um, was made aware of who God really is because of her death, and it's worth it. Um, and so it's just trying to work through that, all the emotions that come along with it. Um, and the beauty of it is, is God's with you every step of the way. He's with you through the anger. He's with you through the sadness. He's with you through the sorrow. Um, he's with you through the rejoicing. And um, it's just drawing on his comfort and his strength um, is more healing probably than anything else. Yeah, and and the thing is, during these times, there's there's plenty of groups. One of them is Grief Shared. That's that's nationwide. Um, I've been to um, a couple of different times, and and definitely a great program. Because the thing is, um, you really have a couple opportunities when something like this happens. You either bury yourself or you figure out how to live differently. And that's really all it is. And, and there's no real shame in it because everyone has someone who's died and it, it affects them all greatly. And I think, I think sometimes, you know, uh, that, that suck it up mentality, you know, um, and just deal with it, um, does leave long-term scars that cannot be undone and does change who you are. And so it's one of those things that, I think for the person who passed away, um, you know, they would want you to be healthy. They would, they would want you to, you know, go to counseling, go to grief share, go to, you know, because they don't want their death to be a stumbling block for you the rest of your life. I, I think back when, um, John died, uh, Susan's brother, some 20 some years ago. I mean, we, we really didn't even know what counseling or, anything was and it was just kind of survive it on your own you know good luck because no one we really knew had lost a sibling and and I think that you know it would have been helpful um at that point if we'd have found counseling or grief share or something of that nature well and I think sometimes counseling <laughs> looked upon as a weakness or um you know you people don't want to go share their stuff with a complete stranger or whatever. But, um, you know, David mentioned sucking it up. Well, you can only suck it up for so long. Um, again, it's one of those things that whether it be grief or anger or, um, just life in general, you can only suck it up for so long before it eats you alive. And that's why it's so important. Even if it's not a professional counselor, finding a good friend or a confidant, because again, you're not looking for necessarily ways to deal with it or handle it. You are looking to just get it out. Um, you know, our counselor talked a lot about um, writing it down or journaling um, because you've got to get it out of your body in order to begin the healing process instead of holding it in and again, letting it just eat you alive. And so um, finding some a counselor or somebody to um, just vent to or whatever is not a sign of weakness. It's, it's a great way to learn how to heal and um, taking that opportunity to just, um, you know, remove it from your head, remove it from your heart and um, allowing God to use getting it out to replace it with his love and his um, goodness and, you know, all the things that he has for you so that you can move on um, from whatever it is that is holding you back. Because it will, um, you know, the more you hang on to, again, grief, anger, anxiety, whatever the case may be, um, the more difficult it is to move forward and then you're stuck. Well, cause it, what you don't understand is it's an anchor and it's a weight that you carry the rest of your life that, that you don't know what to do with. And it doesn't directly affect you. It fatigues you over time and it, it wears you down and someone's got to help you cut that chain. And, and whether it be carrying a burden for a loved one, a guilt, 
shame. I should have dot, dot, dot. I should have dot, dot, dot more. I should have, you know, and that's, that's the part that whoever passed away would not want you to carry for the rest of your life because it does change who you are. It changes your attitude, changes your thought process, um, can make you bitter because, you know, you're really mad at God or you're got mad at them because they left you here. I mean, there, there's a variety of stories that, that has crossed our paths. Uh, you know, when my grandfather died, my grandmother, um, granny didn't, didn't really do anything for three years. And finally the doctor asked her, you know, are you, are you mad because he went to heaven or are you mad because he left you here? And it was really because she was mad because he left her here, you know, and once she got past that, there was, there was real freedom. So, you know, I really would encourage you because I've, I've watched it, especially, um, and Susan with her brother, it, it directly affected her. It was kind of like the, when her brother died, it was the last day she laughed or cried. Mm -hmm. And then once God lifted that from her, it, she was a completely different person. She was working on being a different person. There was definitely evidence of it, but when he lifted the weight, the, then it was the chain was cut. The anchor no longer drug her down. Well, and I would say, yes, that he lifted the weight, but I also had to release it to him. You yeah, know, it, it's definitely a, I mean, and it took 17 years, um, you know, to finally... Um, release that because God had been working on me um, through all those years and I just held on to it until um, I finally got to the place that I could release it and you know I don't know why I held on to it for so long I a lot of times didn't even realize I was hanging on to it for so long but um, so it's a allowing God to to work through you and to change you but you there's also steps that you have to take um, in order to, to heal, you've got to release some things. You've got to let go of some things. And sometimes it's giving it to God over and over and over again. Um, and then he'll release it when he's, when you're ready for him to release it. When yeah. he says it's okay, now it's time. Well, and I think that's, that's very true because a lot of times we, we feel like that it's a, uh, I don't know. Uh, a badge that we need to have the rest of our lives because of the guilt and shame. So we hang on to it um, desperately as kind of their last piece of them. And, you know, it, it, you don't understand how death can affect you until it happens. What I can tell you, and, and you're probably asking at this point, what does this have to do with marriage? Uh -huh. um, you know, number one, this is about life, but it does directly affect your marriage when this happens and it's not dealt with correctly. And, and it really gets to the point to where, um, you're, you're just surviving your marriage. And, and what you may not know is some of it could be related to the death of a, a loved one, um, a family member or a good friend that, that took you by surprise and by not getting help, you tear apart your marriage. Um, you know, I, I think that that to a point, I mean, it, it probably our almost divorce probably did have something to do with John. I hadn't really thought of that to this point, but, you know, it, it, it could have. And and see, that's the problem is, you know, we don't know how much it truly affects us until we're free of it. Mm. And then once you're free of it, it's like, crap, why did I carry this thing for this many years? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, it just gets to feel normal, I guess the weight, the, the fatigue, the, you know, is just normal. And so we, we don't think it directly affects us, but it does. It affects all the, your kids around you, your spouse, your work, your, it really directly affects everything. And, and, uh, whether it's real obvious to you or not, it's probably obvious to other people. Well, and I would just say, you know, as far as, as your spouse goes, it's so crucial to have those conversations um, of, hey, this is really bringing me down, or hey, this is, you know, just talk to one another, because um, if the other person doesn't know what's going on, then by human nature, we just assume that we did something wrong, or they're mad at us, or... They're whatever the case may be, when in reality, 
even subconsciously, they're dealing with the loss of whomever, you know, and so it's so important to, um, to communicate, you know, I don't know what's going on, but I just know that I'm angry or I'm sad or I'm whatever the case may be. And, um, you know, that's where, of course, we've, we've all been told and taught that a successful marriage is you got to communicate. And, and I think that when you're going through, um, grief or a high stress situation, that communication is, has got to be key. Um, don't rely on your spouse to help you get through it. Um, and then, also be the spouse to help the other one get through it. Well, and I just sitting here thinking back and I've never went down this road at all. So this is all kind of brand new, but, um, you know, I knew what was causing Susan's problem. I knew it was related to John. I knew, and, and I was, you know, I didn't want to say anything cause I didn't want to create problems for her when really we probably should have had some conversations along the way. Um, you know, of, Hey, you seem to have changed. Are you doing all right? I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be confrontational, but, um, you know, I, I definitely, I mean, I knew what it was. I knew it was John. And, and then after a couple of years, it kind of just got to be normal. And, and I, as I'm sitting here thinking that, you know, um, if you, if you don't do have the crucial conversation when it, when it's going on in the beginning, by the time you get a couple of years down the road, it becomes normal, which is, it, you, you don't think so, but looking back, I can tell you that's exactly what one of the things that happened to us is I didn't say anything and it just become normal. And, uh, so I think it's one of those things that really, um, as you go through it, you know, you've got to decide what you're going to do. And, uh, as a spouse, you need to speak up sometimes. I mean, I'm not saying it needs to be the next day by no means it, but you know, somewhere you got to have those conversations of I'm concerned about you. Here's kind of what I noticed. And cause when you're walking through the fog, you can't tell that anything's different. It feels the same. Is that a mm -hmm. fair? Yeah. Um, but anyway, we're about out of time and, and, uh, you know, we, this is just kind of, our life dealing with, uh, what our day to day is. And we want you to know you're not alone. That's, that's really, we want to share it with other people and, and just know that you're loved and that you may not feel loved, but Jesus does love you. And I know that's a hard concept sometimes because of the religious, I'm not good enough to be loved mm -hmm. type conversation. But, um, you won't find anywhere in the Bible where it says, clean your crap up before you come to me. And so it's one of those things that's a human trait. So, hey, we love you guys and we hope you have a great week.